talklive.com. And here's Mark. All right, and it's another Edgington Post interview. And today I've got with us, uh, well, a big name, if if not in the libertarian movement, at least on this show. We mention him on a reasonably regular basis. So uh, I thought, uh, you know, since he had an article that was coming out, it might be a good idea to do this particular interview. And I have with me, and I'm going to try to st- say it right here, Stefan Kinsella. You said it perfectly. Okay. Um, Stefan, I, pretty much every time we say your name on the show, we say Stephen. That's okay. <laughs> I come whatever you call me. Okay. Now, you've got a new article out at uh, Mises.org, and it's called How to Improve Patent, Copyright, and Trademark Law. And since you're probably the only trade, you know, IP lawyer in the country that's a real libertarian, you seem to get saddled with, well, all the stuff that is IP law as far as, uh, you know, libertarian thought, right? This is exactly right. <laughs> and, you know, I know that you're, yeah, you're you're probably a really well-rounded libertarian. However, nobody wants to talk to you about your thoughts on roads and, uh, you know, courts or uh, law enforcement in, in a uh, privatized world. They want to talk to you about what you think about patents, copyrights, and trademark. Yeah, that comes up a lot. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to do that to you again today. That's okay. So the the, the article is, is great, um, and it came out today at uh, Mises.org. And um, I, I got a I got an early copy just uh, because I well you know how could I schedule an interview without having an early copy? Um, yeah, you're connected. And, now they've got you've you've got a lot of improvements in this article. You basically go over the idea of how to improve IP law without short of getting rid of it entirely because for whatever reason that seems to be abhorrent to people. And um, I'm all about believing that there's needs to be some inter um, you know intermittent steps between you know wherever here is and wherever freedom might end up. Absolutely. End up. So um, tell me about. Should, do you want to talk about them individually? I uh, patent, uh, copyright, and trademark, or do you want to talk about? Um, well, why don't, let me back up and kind of talk okay. about the, the like the purpose of this article and how it fits in with the sort of libertarian theory on this. Okay. Um, I mean, as I've written before, I believe that uh, IP law, primarily patent and copyright law, those are the two big offenders in the system. Um, trademark and trade secret law are also types of, of IP, but they're not really as problematic for libertarians in my view. Um, I mean, ideally, they should be abolished for several reasons, which we've talked about before on your show and in other contexts. Um, abolition, of course, is not on the table. And now, in my view, you know, we're often accused of, 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 of favoring things that are not practical and only – only taking all or nothing, and of course that's not true. I think that um, um, any steps towards freedom is an improvement. It's just the problem is some things we do are not steps towards freedom. Like for example, you know the voucher system and things like that. You know when we oppose that, we're called uh, idealists or utopians. But the problem with the voucher system, for example, in my view, is that it's not a move towards freedom because it expands the welfare state. But something that's an unambiguous move towards freedom, I think, is a good thing. Like if you cut taxes by five percent, that's good. Um, if you cut taxes by 5% on me and raise them by 5% on someone else, it's not unambiguously good. Right. Um, now, for patent law, um, there have been a lot of proposals for reform in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, it's sort of always hanging out there, and it's bubbling to the surface all, almost past from time to time. The patent lawyers raise a big stink, and they say that there's radical reform. They're going to cut patent rights and all this kind of stuff, um, so little gets done. And, you know, I'm a patent attorney. I practice. I keep up with this stuff. And I started a couple of years ago cataloging all the changes, and I was going to write about them to explain them to libertarians so they would understand the policy changes, you know, being proposed in Congress and what's going on. And it's pretty clear that there's almost never a serious change suggested. They're all little technical changes, and the patent lawyers make a big deal about them so that nothing radical will ever get, you know, passed. Um, and so – you know, I talked to some friends, and they're like, well, what should we do? And I'm like, well, we should abolish it. And they're like, well, if we can't <laughs> abolish it, what should we do? And so I, I was thinking about it like you think of the legislative toolkit or the patent system. Uh, what knobs do we have to turn that would really improve things? Because there's a lot of changes you could make. So I wanted to focus on telling people, you look, if you really want to make serious change, okay, here's what we should do. And so uh, that's why I tried to identify, and I focused on patent law in the article, although at the end of it I suggested some changes for copyright law and also trademark law. Mm -hmm. But basically I went through a laundry list of changes um, for patents, and starting with the ones that probably would be the most important uh, that could make the most most, uh, improvement in matters. 
So um, do you, do you want to go through that list, or do you want uh, people to, to read the article? That way they'll get a clearer picture? Well, let me go through a few of them. Let me tell you okay. how I came up with the idea. I mean, so the idea is this. The, the primary justification that most advocates of intellectual property use, is, including libertarians uh, who favor IP, is, is they'll say basically you have to have this as an incentive to produce wealth and, and uh Innovation, basically, mm-hmm. in terms of art, artistic creations, which is copyright and, and inventions and scientific and technical things, which is patents. Um, and the, the basically the implicit idea is that um, what they say is when you add a patent, when you have a patent system, it increases overall wealth in society by expanding the amount of innovation that there would be that there otherwise would be and it, it and, and I have been on that side of the argument in the past right. um, and I you know essentially after our converse shortly after our conversation I have abandoned uh, most of that too simply because I believe in intellectual property I just don't believe that the government is the best, uh, you know, organization to protect it. I think that it uh, it it causes disastrous results when um, one uses the government um, apparatus to protect intellectual property, and I and I can see those disastrous results. I just think that you know, I think the two biggest areas that people worry about the most, or at least the ones that I did, uh, were blockbuster movies and drug patents. Exactly. And and that's a consequential concern, which I can understand and respect, and which a lot of libertarians have, and they, they blend that with a principled approach. Um, but w- focusing on it the way you did, I think, helps you see the sort of problem with libertarian advocacy of IP, and that is that unlike other forms of property, like uh, you know just property rights in land or uh, inheritance rights or roads and things like this, you could imagine these things existing in a private court system or a private society without the government, but it's really hard to imagine patenting copyright existing without the government to support it. And if you try to think, well, it could be created by a private uh, contractor. Like, for example, Robert Hessen has written some interesting stuff uh, a couple decades ago showing that uh, corporations could uh, – or something like a corporation could exist merely with an assembly of private contracts. So if you took away the government uh, limited liability grant and the government incorporation statutes, you could still have corporations. So you could see how in a private society that thing would still exist. But for copyright and patent, some people say, well, it's it's a type of fraud or it's based upon the contract, what you stamp on the book. All these kind of arguments, what they're saying is you could have IP by private contract in a free society, but the problem is IP by its nature, what we have now, affects third parties. And you can't do that with copyright. So basically, unlike other other institutions we have that could survive in some form in a private society, patent and copyright cannot. So I do think you're right. That's one way to see that it could not uh, exist in a private society or in a libertarian uh, private court system. Well, I, I, I think it could exist in the sense that it's yours if you can protect it. <laughs> Correct. Uh, so um, if, for instance, I am a large drug manufacturer and I come out with a drug that, you know, uh, took up mi- millions and millions of dollars of uh, R&D, hundreds of millions of dollars of R&D, which – by the way, those hundreds of millions would still pale in comparison to the the even more hundreds of millions that I would have spent trying to protect that going through the um, and going through the FDA's system. So, um, you know, if you <laughs> one has to figure that in, um, a lot of R and D at this point is going through the governmental systems and um, the the IP attorneys, right, and and all that stuff. So, right, what, and and so well, so let's. Let's go back to this utilitarian rationale. People, you know, they. I mean, look. I think it's a respectable argument to make, although I think there are some problems with uh, with uh, the utilitarian approach. But if you're serious about this, then you would think you would have reasons. You would have uh, evidence for this. If you say we need a patent system because it creates wealth, then you should be able to answer the question: Well, how much wealth does it create? In other words, there's a cost to the system, and allegedly it produces benefits, and the difference between them is allegedly positive. What is it? No one can tell you. They really have no idea. It's well, not if, a serious argument. I, I understand, but if the libertarians make the opposite argument that uh, intellectual property uh, stifles the um, the marketplace, once again, you cannot quantify, um, especially in that case, a negative. Um, so you know you've, you've got a you've got an equal and opposite argument on the other side. That's true. And if, if we only had utilitarian arguments to make, it would it could be a stalemate, except for the fact that all of the studies that rely upon sort of standard. Uh, empirical or utilitarian um, or wealth maximization type arguments 
they pretty much all conclude that the patent system is either – they either conclude that they can't prove that it does anything good or they conclude that it, in the sector we looked at, it's, it's, a, it's a harm. Now, you're right. You can't always uh, um, prove it or disprove a right. negative. But well, the studies, the studies lean against what they're trying to show. Right, and I and I, I would like to say, um, from a standpoint of, of somebody who comes from a utilitarian thought process, um, and that's that, it, that that's where I'm coming from. I believe, from a utilitarian standpoint, we should get rid of government-sanctioned uh, IP law because it stifles innovation in the marketplace. And I guess the proof was, is Mary Ruart writes in, in her book, Healing Our World, and um, I think it's the new edition, where you know she used to work in the medical field prior to them really pushing uh, the pharmaceutical, in the pharmaceutical field, prior to them really pushing IP law and really using IP law. Um, right. And she you know, said that innovations were bigger then, and um, and and people, you know, it saved more people. More innovations yeah. came about yeah. that it was bigger then. So that cuts out of the two giants inside the IP argument, which are drug companies and blockbuster movies. It cuts one of them out. And my thought process is a utilitarian. I love blockbuster movies. I really enjoyed Avatar. But um, hey, you know, it, even if it doesn't work, and you know, maybe it would, right? But even if it doesn't work, I'm willing to let blockbuster movies go in order to have uh, huge innovations in the area of uh, medicine, pharmaceuticals, and things like that. Yeah, and I, I mean, in a way that's similar to the the principal argument a lot of libertarians take towards things like uh, I remember when I was sort of learning libertarianism 20, 25 years ago. You know, I was attracted to the argument by uh, Greenspan <laughs> at the time <laughs> and Rand about, say, antitrust law. Their argument was not primarily uh, consequentialist. It was, you know, you have the right to sell your products for whatever price you want, even if it's bad for consumer welfare, according to what some uh, some economists would say. So right. it's first and foremost a principled approach. Um, but you know, I, 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 so what I did was I, I said, listen. If we want to make some headway, let's come up with an argument that that should satisfy even the concerns of you know honest advocates of IP who have utilitarian reasons because they all believe that there the copyright term should not be infinite and it shouldn't be zero. They think there's some kind of optimum curve somewhere in the middle. Yeah, and I and the I, government can find it. Yeah, and okay. they think we're close to it or we're there for some reason, and although they can't prove it. Right. Um, so but, presumably, but they keep on changing it. I mean, the Sonny Bono law took uh, took what was probably the optimum number there um, or close to the optimum number for songs and expanded them out to, what, 99 years? And exactly. God, and God knows when, when what they're going to expand it out to after that. I mean, the person who wrote uh, – the, the, the family of the people who wrote Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer are never going to work again. Yeah, and and it's, it's you know one of the researchers I quoted in the article is a guy who talks about uh, you know he, he refers to this as the laffer curve of innovation. They think we're on say one side of the peak of that curve, you know, uh, although they have no reason to think that. And not only that, like patents, for example, cover things like plants, um, and regular patents cover um, pharmaceuticals, like you mentioned, but also software and uh, mechanical inventions, electrical inventions, and it gives them all the same term, basically about seven, roughly 17 years. Well. Well, that doesn't make sense. How about five years for one, seven for the other? I mean, you would think there'd be optimal curves for each one. Sure. So it's a one size fits all situation uh, problem. But it seems to me that if your argument is that um, number one, you you wouldn't want to you know make it add the death penalty for uh, for for patent infringement, let's say. So that they must think that some some remedies would be too strenuous that we don't need to go that far, or they don't want to make it a fifty year patent term. So. They obviously think at some point the cost would outweigh the extra benefits you get. Well, my argument is that if they don't have actual numbers for justifying where we are right now, then if I can say, listen, if I reduce the patent term by 10 years, we know that would reduce the cost on the economy significantly. So that's definitely a gain, and we have no reason to believe that it would be a significant um, uh, loss of uh, uh, incentive effect for innovation. There would still be some incentive effect for innovation. So, to my mind, there's there's no basis for an advocate, a utilitarian advocate of IP to oppose a modest reduction in some of these costs, um, as, uh, unless it's obvious that it would, uh, you know, have a significant reduction in the incentive effects that they favor. Right, and and, and the and, thought and, process there must be for them if we reduce the uh, the years that uh, a patent is protected. That well, at that point, that a company has to roll out and uh, very quickly and make its its uh, recoup its R and D money in a in a, a very short period of time. So that'll be better for the marketplace. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's all kind of compensating uh, costs here, and uh, um, you know, so, so so let me just mention a few of the top things I, I proposed, and we can talk about a couple of those. The first one would be to reduce the patent term, as I mentioned already, uh, and you already have mainstream advocates like Jeff Bezos, the, he's the CEO of Amazon, or the Amazon CEO proposing like a three- to five-year patent term for software patents anyway. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he What's the point has... anything longer than that? I mean, are, are they afraid that somebody's going to steal Windows 3.1 and trot that out on the marketplace and steal their uh, um, you know, the, the, the Microsoft's position with exactly. a 10-year-old operating system? Exactly. And, you know, you could say the same thing for copyright as well. 15. I mean, even with movies and things like this, I mean, the bulk of the profits are made in the first several years. I mean, if you had a 10-year copyright term instead of 120 uh, you know, you would still have a large incentive to make these movies to recoup the monopoly profits you're able to, you know, to extract. So, I mean, uh, it, but it would greatly increase creativity, the public comments available for people. Uh, it would free up, uh, you know, uh, the, it would solve so much of these orphan works problems. Um, and What's an orphan be, work? The orphan works problem is that there are, I think, millions of works out there that uh, p- people cannot identify who the owners of copyrighted works are, even to contact them to ask permission hmm. to copyright. The, and these things are basically out of print, they're dead, but they're sort of in limbo, so they're trapped by the uh, the fact that the copyright system is automatic. So the copyright, unlike patents at least, where you have to apply for it, so it's clear what the patent is on right. and who the, who, the, who the owner is. For copyrights, it's just if you find a written work out there, uh, you may not know who has the rights. You may not. You may not even know who the author is, or if you do, how to contact them, or who has the rights. Yeah. So this is a huge problem. This orphan works problem. This is what Amazon is dealing with in part, with their attempt to uh, uh, to their Google Books project, their Google Print project. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, in a way, they're hoping that they're you know they're hoping to be sued in this class action settlement, so they can get a judgment from a court saying they're they're free to go forward with this with this scheme. Otherwise, it's in limbo. You know, um, but. And so, in addition to reducing the term, another thing you could do is you could radically cut back the scope of copyright um, patents. That means the types of inventions that patents cover. They used to cover sort of, you know, basically methods or technical processes and contraptions, inventions, apparatuses, you know, yeah. machines or devices. And now they cover um, uh, software and uh, business methods and things like this. Um, you know, if we got rid of, we rolled it back to the way it was. You know, 20 years ago, there'd be much less scope of patents to cover um, copy. Um, sorry, uh, software, which is already covered by copyright, and uh, business methods. And in fact, you mentioned the pharmaceutical case. This is the case that's mentioned over and over again. If if that's really the you know the, the example that's given over and over again, why don't we just have patents for pharmaceuticals and for nothing else? Right. You know, uh, let's, 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 it's a it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, software really should fall into the copyright area because a patent. Um, a patent is on something, and I don't, I don't even have the, the, the verbiage to, to properly express this, but a patent, you can, uh, you can cross a patent, you can get on the wrong side of a patent, you can get sued for a patent infringement if you, go some, if you invent something accidentally and it's the same. Whereas a copyright, two people can create the same work um, you know, accidentally, and they haven't infringed on each other. That's correct. Yeah, copy, so copyright basically... Pr- Gives you the right to copy. So if yes. someone else doesn't copy your work, they're not infringing your right. If they, so if they independently come up with the same solution for a software problem or something like that, it's probably because there's only a few types of solutions for that problem, and they right. each came up with it. Pa- a patent cover is functional. It covers the way something works or is, is configured. You don't have to be a copier at all to be liable for co- patent infringement. Uh, it's just if you're doing what the patent describes, you can be liable. In fact, you you might have independently invented it before. The patentee filed his patent. He yeah, it doesn't have, matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And so, um, you know, uh, so you have these like big chemical companies and people that they have trade secrets. They keep their some of their processes secret. Like they have these nozzles for mixing chemicals and things like this, and they keep them secret for you know fifty years maybe. And they they make a great product. No one else can quite match the yep. quality of this product, and that's perfectly fine. That's sure. their right to do that. They have that big. In, they, they have that big to do about the uh, the the old formula for Dr Pepper. I think it was last year or something that mm-hmm. it came out. I don't know if you you heard about it. And and then prior to that, it was the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken's original herbs and spices. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. Uh, the 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 uh, grease stained copy of the Colonel's original writing. Uh, you know that they had that they were moving under lock and key. You know a caravan of fifty. Uh, you know uh, armored trucks driving mm-hmm. along, moving this very. Important 
important item. That's intellectual property. There's no doubt about it. But the government isn't doing anything to protect it. Well, and so that is what people the, – the problem is under the current IP regime, if you rely upon something like that, okay, now not so much the KFC case because that's not really a patentable thing. So you're not in danger of getting shut down by a patent from someone else usually. But, but in other cases, let's say you have your, your, your chemical mixing process as a trade secret and you're yeah. doing it for a long time. Some other guy comes along. He invents it independently. He files a patent on it. Now he can stop you from making what you've been making for 30 years. Yeah, it's r- ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And, uh, and, you know, and you ask these advocates of IP, well, or even like Ayn Rand tried to justify this kind of practice. She looks, well, you had a chance to go to the courthouse. And it's like, well, I didn't want to make it public, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, and if you think about the pharmaceutical case, which we were just talking about, um, okay, if we give them a patent. Now, some people would say, well, if you give them a, five, a five-year, ten-year patent, well, it takes five years to get the FDA approval. That's not fair. Well, first of all, the patent law has a built-in extension. It, it kind of gives you an extension to make up for time you, you lose on the government regulatory process. But this sort of raises the question, why would you trust the government to give you the right incentive to make up for the regulatory delay that they've imposed on you and to help you have enough profit margins left over after the government has robbed you through taxes and regulations and uh, impoverishing society so there's less consumer demand in the first place because they're regulating and taxing them. I mean, it's just ridiculous. How about advocating getting rid of the state regulating and taxing you in the first place? How about abolishing the FDA? And then we wouldn't have to make up, you know, give you a, a monopoly patent grant to sort of make up for the damage we're doing to you with these other programs. <laughs> well, that's how the government that how, that's how it work, constantly works with the government. The government creates um, you know, the government solution creates a government problem, so they have to have another government solution which creates another mm-hmm. government problem which you know, it's just constant. Controls, free controls. And not only that, yep. the government passes antitrust law, which says it's illegal to, to, to abuse a monopoly position or to try to get a monopoly position. At the same time, they're granting monopolies. And so the courts say, of course, there's a tension in the law. <laughs> there's a tension <laughs> between the patent law and the antitrust law. Right. They don't say this is stupid. They say there's a tension. <laughs> Yeah, so in other words, they say, well, yeah, it looks like you're violating the Sherman Antitrust Act, but on the other hand, the government gave you this monopoly, so you can use it, but you can't abuse it. And so then there's all these, um, um, uh, you know, uh, further regulations about what you can do with this antitrust law and this patent law. Um, And it's just a big government mess, and and it's it's hard to fathom why libertarians of all people would be in favor of this. this Right. So now um, let's go on to uh, copyright, and uh, then um, I, there's there are very few solutions you've got here for uh, trademark. But um, let's go on to t- the copyright. You s- you suggest in your your first uh, solution there is to radically reduce the term from life plus seventy years for copyright yep. to uh, which means that basically you're uh, you're you're making it so their their children, their grandchildren, maybe even as far as their great grandchildren don't have to work, yeah. which is ludicrous. Yes. To yes. And, um, say 10 years. Uh, and, and on the other side, for works that don't have a lot of value, they're basically just tied up. I mean, you, you yeah. encounter this mentality even among uh, scholars and people like this. You know, I, I think I, I, I mentioned – I talked to some scholar the other day who uh, – that's a book that was published 25 years ago, and it's out of print. It's hard to find. He's not selling any copies, making nothing on it, but it's sitting there in paper. And I, I asked him, well, why don't you just you know put a scanned copy up on your website? And he's like, oh, well, I, you know – because that's not fair, you know. I'm not going to let people have it for free. It's like, well, that means you want your ideas to stay trapped, you know, trapped in this volume. It's, it's sure. this, this mentality that doesn't uh, help anyone. But yeah, um, yeah but, so but it's sort of should... bred into them. And and I, I came across this once too. I found a it was a short story and a compilation of liberty. It was a liberty short story, of a science fiction liberty short story. So you can see how obscure it is. It's it's both liberty oriented and science fiction. So it's mm-hmm. it's bizarre. And um, I, I can't remember the name of it uh, off the top of my head, but I, I think it's from uh, Visions of Liberty by published mm-hmm. by ba- Bain Publishers. Or, you know, the, I think it was the book before that one in that compilation. Anyway, mm-hmm. it, it's, you know, it's it's a few pages long, 30 pages long or mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. And I tried, I wanted to read it um, as a an audio book for my audience. 
mm-hmm. people aren't getting this. They're not, you know, the, the book had been printed quite some time ago. Mm-hmm. It was sort of mm-hmm. out of print. If it's sitting on any shelves, um, it's been sitting there. It's it's been collecting dust for years there, mm-hmm. uh, a, sev- a couple of years there. Um, if it, it was if it was sitting on shelves, the author had been dead. It was compiled into this book, okay. And the um, so I had to call some lawyer in England, and then that lawyer called me back, gave me the, you know, some other lawyer in New York. I don't remember exactly how it went, but basically they told me no, you know, you can't read this book. And right, so I and couldn't, it didn't really do them any good to do that. Right. If there's, right, there's no the, people aren't the, the the family isn't making money off of this story. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's absolutely ludicrous. All I was going to do is read it and give it away. It is, it is ludicrous. Um, um, I, and I think another change we could make that would be a, a big improvement for copyright would be uh, instead of it, it's hard to it's hard to really believe this is the case because it's not pointed out this explicitly. But right. under the current regime we have now, since the I think since the late '80s, um, you no longer have to put a copyright notice on a work. In fact, it doesn't do much good to do it. Yeah. You don't have to register it with the copyright. You only have to write it on a piece of paper or fix it in some you know some medium, and then yeah. you have a copyright. Yes. Whether you want it or not. And it's almost impossible to get rid of it. I mean, <laughs> you can't just put a notice on there saying, uh, I don't have a copyright in this, because you do. Yes. You do have a copyright. And so but the, a big change in the copyright law, in my opinion, would be to make it um, opt opt in instead of opt out. In fact, there's not even an opt out right now. But or at least cases, give you the ability to opt um, to opt out if you wish by putting something on there that says that you've opted out. That would be a simple change. It would be great. Right now, you have the Creative Commons. They've tried to make this thing called uh, CC zero, but they're not sure if it'll work in mo- in every country because you know there's no consideration for this contract, or it's not really there's no there's no other party. You're just putting a notice on there. What if you change your mind and yeah. you know it's not a signed contract with the reader? So these things are have uh, doubtful validity. Um, so there should be a way to opt out, but better yet, there should be a way to uh, – there should be no copyright unless you request it and apply for it. Uh, so basically they should change it to the more like the way it used to be. You should have, have to have active registration, and it should expire like in 10 years unless you renew it, and you should have a limited number of times you can renew it. Right. So that and would be a big improvement. I'd like to point out that there are all kinds of important works of literature out there that people are reading and enjoying that book publishers – just publish with you know no rights at all. I mean, I, I, I you know Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, Treasure <laughs> Island, uh, Mark Twain's works, all these things. I saw one recently where somebody wrote um, they wrote a book with Tom Sawyer, uh, Tom Sawyer and zombies, mm-hmm. and it was they they credited Mark Twain as the author, uh, Mark Twain, excuse me, uh, as the author along with the the other author. So he sort of. <laughs> you know, took chunks of Tom Sawyer and then mixed zombies in or something like right. that. And this is, a, you know, amazing creative bit of work where, sure. uh, you know, the the a, a descendants of Mark Twain are, are jilted out of their rightful earnings. Because, right. you know, with his lifetime plus 70 years, well, I, I don't know how close that would put us to today, but it seems like I he mean, was around the, in the 1850s. So, look, I mean, if you think about it, of course, it's obvious that Everything we do in life that's technical or creative or innovative or artistic builds upon things we've learned. Yeah. Basically, human life, human society progresses because we have an accumulating body of knowledge, right. artistic knowledge, you know, literature, Fire. Uh, scientific knowledge, <laughs> and we build on that. And thank God that it's not uh, uh, that it's not uh, scarce like property is. But thank God it can be transmitted from mind to mind and built upon from generation to generation. Sure. So Is, basically copyright and patent law seek to hamper learning yep. and transmission of knowledge. That's what it seeks to do. Absolutely true. Can you imagine if every electronic and if you device – that way, I think it's, it, it shows how, how ridiculous it is. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you want to go through a few more of these specific examples. Um, yeah, go I ahead. Could, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what I was going to – let me mention the, the – so – you mentioned trade secret earlier uh, as a more innocuous uh, uh, practice, and I agree it is. But even it, the, basically the state corrupts everything it touches. And I didn't mention trade secret in here because it was mostly about patent, and I didn't, you know, it was getting over long. Um, I deal with trade secret and trademark pretty extensively um, in my longer piece against intellectual property. But even trademark and trade secret are corrupted by the state's influence. For example, the way trade secret works is. Let's say you and your employees have a contractual agreement to keep something secret, and one of your employees uh, uh, leaks it to his friend at a cocktail party or mm-hmm. to a competitor or to his new employer if he leaves. If 
if the secret is still containable, if it hasn't gotten out to the world at large, the court can issue an injunction against these third parties and tell them you can't reveal this, and if you do, you can go to jail for contempt of court. So basically, the court steps in even there and enforces these rights against third against third parties. But at least there's some basis for the for that idea. Uh, you know, it's based in the original contract, yeah. although it's extended by the state. And trademark law has been corrupted beyond. Um, uh, 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 its original foundations. First of all, trademark law for the libertarian ought to be based upon fraud. Yeah, that's where I'm, I see it um, as, as a fraud issue. If but if somebody... it's fraud, the plaintiff is going to be the customer who's defrauded by this guy, not the not the right. other company who's not involved in the transaction. Well, one might think that um, that the company which has an interest in protecting its uh, its trademark might take up the case in sort of a class action yeah, manner yeah, for yeah. The, 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 the people who are injured. For instance, yeah. if somebody puts out a cola, calls that cola delicious Coca-Cola, yeah. and um, then I drink delicious Coca-Cola, and it, and it in fact tastes like licorice, and it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm horrified by it, but it was only 50 cents. So yeah. I spit it out, I throw it on the ground, and I walk away. I haven't been, you know, like I, I may or may not come after that company, and then what, what are my damages in a, in a, in a world where they give uh, real and, and good, you know, and fair damages? Yeah, and I, I agree that I agree. I agree with that. And you would have to have a more co, a more uh, 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 extensively worked out theory of class action that's libertarian compatible to go with that. But uh, you, you could imagine an argument that look in a private society, um, the the real victim of the crime is the is the defrauded customer. Mm-hmm. But they're not going to pursue this. We can presume their consent to grant sort of a, a, an implicit uh, consent. To the uh, to the trademark holder to represent them. Okay, you could you could I could see that. But in that case, the argument would only be for cases of fraud, basically, which was the case you described. But it would not cover all these other cases of knockoffs. For example, yeah. the Louis Vuitton or the Rolex watches. These people are not defrauded. They know yeah. that they're buying a knockoff. They want to buy a knockoff because it's cheaper. In that case. You could not uh, use the theory you mentioned to justify the kind of trademark actions we have now. Sure. And, and furthermore, trademark law has been extended about uh, 15, 20 years ago with something called dilution. So now, uh, under, under normal trademark law, you have to show that the consumer is uh, basically um, – there's a, there's a likelihood of confusion. You know, He's basically almost defrauded. But under dilution, you just have to show that this other company's use of their own mark might – dilute the value of your mark, tarnish it or something like that. So this is the basis of all these trademark claims you see nowadays, and it's completely illegitimate and not grounded in fraud at all. Makes sense to me. I mean, I, 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 I have to say that it, it seems silly to be going after people that are selling, you know, jokelies or, or whatever um, knockoff thing. Now, if they're selling it as... Or the, or the South Butt, I think, was the recent one, North Face South Butt. I don't even like know. That. I, don't, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm not no, one. You know, no one, no one's going to think the North Face is the ones really behind the South Butt. You know, yeah. it's sort of a play on words. It's sort right. of a joke. Makes sense. Um, right. So, so st- I can mention one more here yeah, that uh, I have written down here. Well, first of all, we can. Get, I think we can all agree. All libertarians should agree that we should get rid of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act provisions, which are sort of part of copyright law now. This is basically um, what they did was they said, um, okay, it's illegal to copy something that's protected. And it's illegal to um, to dec- decrypt, you know, uh, uh, copyright prevention techniques like encrypted works. So you can't you can't in- unencrypt a you know a, a, an encrypted DVD. Uh, okay, you can see that as an extension of copyright law. It's not a good one. And then they said, well, what if someone is selling a device that could be used to do that? So now it's basically a criminal or a sense to sell a device that other people could use. To decrypt. So I guess every computer is theoretically a dangerous weapon now, right? Yeah. Because they can be programmed to decrypt things. There was this uh, at one point this uh, PlayStation Two device that allowed you to to get cheats and stuff and on games and uh, you know probably play games. I think they were copied or something like that. I don't know if you you know what this device was called, but I I don't remember. But um, it was basically a, a hacker gamer device, and you had to well you actually had to solder the thing in yeah. in order to make it work. And that thing would be illegal. I haven't seen one advertised in a while, so it probably did become illegal. Yeah, they call them anti circumvention technologies. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, so you see all these, it's like you said earlier, breed controls, breed controls. And to enforce these arbitrary and unjust laws um, that are basically artificial schemes, of course, you have to keep finding more. I was telling some friends the other day about one um, 
uh, one of my friends said, well, um, uh, you know, I was explaining that um, – uh, it, it's hard to get protection for, um, like, Lego blocks or Trivial Pursuit cards. You know, you could sell something like that that works for this game as long as you don't – I mean, there's no patent on it. There's only a trademark issue, and as long as you don't pretend like it's authorized by the, the maker of Trivial Pursuit or Lego, you can sell a block that says this block will fit on a Lego set. It's a true statement. So and it, they that. sell them. They do sell them. Yeah, you can do that, and, and, and um, in, in America, at least, you can have comparative advertising. You can actually mention the other competitor's trademark as long as you don't do so deceitfully. Uh, right. So you can say, you know, Coca-Cola tastes better than Pepsi. They can actually say the word Pepsi in the ad. I think in Europe, Europe you can't do that. But what, what you'll have people do is, like, you'll have uh, – the reason laser cartridges, for example, are so expensive for, for laser printers, um, and this is how – HP and these companies make their money off the cartridges, right, just like the razor blades of these safety razors. Mm -hmm. What they do is they will intentionally invent a pretty small or trivial in circuit or invention that they can get a patent on, something that you really don't need to do this, but they get a patent on some little circuit that measures something. And they'll put you know, half a circuit in the cartridge and half a circuit in the machine, or they'll put all the circuit in the machine, and you have to have that in there for the machine to work. Basically, they make a product, they put a patented item in it on purpose that you have to have for it to be compatible with the laser printer, so that if anyone sells a cartridge, they're infringing a patent, right? Yeah. And so what people started doing was they would say, well, I'll just buy it from overseas. So Congress patches the patent law and adds an importation thing. And they say, well, okay, well, I'll make just part of it overseas. I'll put it, part of it here. And I'll put it together here. So Congress passed a law that covered that. They covered that loophole. So people keep trying to find ways around these these crazy laws, and, go, and the government keeps trying to chase them. It's just like um, you know, people find ways around tax loopholes, and the government patches the tax code to catch what they're doing. Yep, that's how it goes. The government's always got a new solution for a problem that it created. Um, it, it it's amazing. Now tell people where they can find this article at uh, Mises.org. Uh, it was, it's at Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot -E org, and it's, it's on one of the Mises Daily articles that was published today on the 20th. And I always have links to my articles um, on my own website, which is stephankinsella.com, S-T-E-P-H-A-N, Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A dot com. Thanks very much, Stefan, and uh, yeah, I, I hope to have you on again soon. Thanks, Mark. I enjoy it. Yep, thank you. Attention, all active duty members and veterans of the U.S. military. Your proud service to your country entitles you with the right to participate in special VA loan programs with benefits not available to the general public, like the ability to purchase a new home with no down payment or mortgage insurance, or refi with cash out up to 100% of your present home equity with less strict credit criteria. You are entitled to these benefits. Review them online at varadio.com. This is Tim Lewis from iFreedom Direct and a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. I want you to know that as a member or veteran of the United States military, you've earned special rights and privileges. On your feet and get the details at varadio.com. iFreedom Direct Corporation is a private lender approved by the VA and licensed in most states. In certain states, certain restrictions and limitations apply. For a current list of licenses, disclosures, and all benefits, go to varadio.com. varadio.com. 